just touched down on that nest site. I think the other adult is right on the nest. When park ecologists find peregrine falcons nesting on a cliff face in Puckasaw National Park, it's reason to celebrate. Oh, all the nestlings. I see all the nestlings and a parent is feeding them. Peregrine falcons had all but disappeared from the Canadian wilderness. This discovery is a sign that the species has regained a foothold here. But falcons aren't the only endangered species that are benefiting from the refuge that Pakasa National Park provides. Lake sturgeon have recently been discovered in the park's rivers once again. They're the oldest fish species that we know of in the Great Lakes. They've been around since the dinosaurs have been here. In this rugged landscape, modern technology has been combined with ancient wisdom to protect a crucial Great Lakes habitat. The results have been breathtaking. Puckasaw National Park has become the setting for some of the greatest success stories in the history of the Canadian National Park system. High above the White River, engineers work to complete a suspension bridge. The heights are daunting, the work is dangerous, but when the bridge is complete, a 60-kilometer hiking trail that winds along Lake Superior's northern coast will be restored for visitors to use. It's a one-way route, there's no loop. It's uh, been parallel to the West Coast Trail and Pacific Rim National Park for uh, Eastern Canada in difficulty and in also in, in grandeur and, and visual. There's uh, designated sites along campsites along the coast, along the Lake Superior coast, uh, but other than that, it, it would just be remote camping in the backcountry. Puckasaw National Park is a prime destination for travelers with adventurous spirits. The scenery is outstanding, and really I find there's nothing like it in Ontario, in Eastern Canada even. <laughs> I, I think um, this park is probably the best kept secret of Ontario. A trip here is a chance to roam a landscape renewed. In the 1880s, commercial loggers and miners began to exploit the region's abundant natural resources. But in 1978, nearly 2,000 square kilometers of land on the northern coast of Lake Superior was protected when Puckasaw National Park was established. It is part of the largest stretch of continuous, undeveloped coastline in the Great Lakes. And it's a park that has no shortage of admirers. Lake Superior is like this tepid woman. She can be just absolutely raging one day and then flat calm the next. Hiking Puckasaw's coastal trail is just one of the activities visitors come here to do. The park is also a big draw for avid paddlers. You know, you paddle out here, you go two minutes in either direction away from the structures and the trails, and you're into absolute wilderness. It's a rugged uh, shoreline. It's challenging because of the ruggedness. You, you know, once you're out onto the lake, 
uh, oftentimes if it's raging out there, you're out. You're, you have uh, limited options in terms of uh, being able to land. So there's the inherent challenge and danger associated with being out there. But there's the, the level of beauty that just cannot be found anywhere else. I'm sorry, but it's, uh, it's just, it's beautiful. The isolated coves, beaches, and cliffs of Pakasa are the main attractions for visitors that come here seeking an escape. There are only two kilometers of roads in Pakasa, so accessing some of the park's most scenic spots takes dedication. For Parks Canada ecologists, the remoteness is both a blessing and an added challenge. It's all about accessing sites by boat or by helicopter. It's really tricky to get to the same site uh, more than once in a season uh, because of the cost and the time that's required. With many of the park's wildlife monitoring sites located in remote locations, each research trip is crucial. Every year, starting in June, we check out cliff sites along our coast to look for signs of nesting peregrine falcons. Um, this site is one that uh, we've known about for at least a, a few years. From the late 1940s through the 1970s, the peregrine falcon was driven to the brink of extinction. Widespread use of pesticides like DDT in agriculture weakened their eggshells, making it difficult for the falcons to reproduce. But ecologists believe the species may be making a resurgence. It's really tricky to find the nest, but the most important uh, part of our monitoring is just to see signs of an adult that's obviously acting in a territorial behavior. If Martha can spot a pair of falcons with nestlings in the cliff face, it will be a victory for the Parks Canada team. I see one adult that's flying. Um, I, don't, I don't see the second right now. You saw a second one, Wayne? Oh, yeah. OK, so he's exact. He just touched down on that nest site. I think the other adult is right on the nest. Oh, all the nestlings. I see all the nestlings, and a parent is feeding them. The discovery of a peregrine falcon nest in Puckasa that has successfully reared young means Parks Canada ecologists are one small step forward in their attempt to help reestablish the species in the park. The peregrine falcon isn't the only species that is being closely monitored within Puckasa National Park. Parks Canada ecologists are also focusing attention on the woodland caribou population. But there's a problem. Ecologists know that a relic herd exists in the park, but they just can't track it down. For decades, a relic herd of woodland caribou has thrived along the northern shores of Lake Superior. But ecologists are afraid that it is in recession. The caribou herd in the park that we've monitored using aerial surveys for the last 30 years has shown a steady decline in the past 20 years or so. Part of the reason is that the forest outside of the park has been changed dramatically and um, 
There's been a succession uh, to much younger forests, which is more suitable for moose. And uh, moose bring in predators like wolves, and that changes the predator-prey dynamics that caribou would have been used to in the past. When ecologists have tried to count woodland caribou populations by helicopter, they have come up with disturbing numbers. Recent counts put the population at only four. That's down from the dozens of caribou that they were able to count in the park during the 1970s. Now, ecologists are trying a new method. We've deployed 13 cameras up and down the coast in areas where we suspect caribou to be, either because we've seen them there in the past or there are trails where we've found scat. Every few months, ecologists visit the remote cameras to swap out digital data cards. The uh, camera is showing 258 uh, pictures were taken. The uh, data card is 4% full. So I'm just going to take the uh, data card out and replace it with a new card. So hopefully we have a, a woodland caribou crossing this path. Um, my guess we'll probably get moose, wolf, black bear, maybe lynx. Today, their hard work has paid off. Of the hundreds of captured images, Several are of woodland caribou. While some ecologists have their eyes on the forests and the skies of Puckasaw, others are concerned with life underwater. close to 40 kilograms big, so it's a nice big sturgeon captured once. This one actually spawned this year. Caught it earlier this year. It spawned out, and now uh, we'll add a radio tag and figure out where it goes from here. So I think we've got one more big one in the net here. So we'll just set her down in her slide while there. They were the oldest fish species that we know of in the Great Lakes. They've been around since the dinosaurs have been here. Many species have come and gone uh, since this species has been around. Andrew Ecclestone is a graduate student at Trent University. He studies the lake sturgeon population in the Great Lakes Basin. The lakes and rivers of Puckasaw National Park serve as an outdoor laboratory for his research. Last year was the first time we've ever had lake sturgeon recorded in the river widely distributed throughout all the Great Lakes, but they're threatened provincially, and uh, this is the research that hopefully will lead to the recoveries. It's a nice big sturgeon. This one we haven't caught ever yet. You can tell they're more feisty. <laughs> So they're very strong, powerful fish, as you can see. <laughs> Lake sturgeons spawn in the rivers and tributaries in the park from April to June. Ecologists track them down in the summer months before they head back out into Lake Superior or rest in deep pools of the river in early autumn. If Andrew's research is correct, the population of this prehistoric fish is stabilizing. Being a little bit, they are actually one of the oldest living species in our Great Lakes. Uh, they were hunted commercially uh, by commercial anglers in the late 1800s and early 1900s, which uh, decimated a lot of their numbers. But they're starting to recover, but we've got a long way to go before that we get back to their historical numbers. With some minor surgery, Andrew inserts radio tracking technology into the belly of the lake sturgeon that he captures. 
It will only put one out at a time and only perform one surgery at a time. So I just put that guy in a live well there while we uh, add the anesthetizing agent to this uh, water bath here. Once a species becomes listed as threatened, it's uh, very crucial to identify critical habitat within the river and to identify what parts of the river they're using and why. So this information will identify where within the river they're located, and it'll also give us ideas about how their movements relate to uh, the water temperature, the water flow, uh, and everything else that is happening in the river. So. With the surgery complete, the captured sturgeon are released. So they do take a little bit to recover, so we end up just leaving them here at the side of the shore um, for a few minutes. If Andrew's research is correct, the population of this prehistoric fish is stabilizing. Yet another ecological victory fostered by the protected habitat of Puckasaw National Park. Pakshewa, the name Pakasa, meaning the cleaning of the fish camp area. That's what it would that's what it would mean. Colette Goodchild, an elder from the Pick River First Nations begins a smudging ceremony near Hattie Cove. My spiritual name is North Wind and Morning Star, and I would offer tobacco to a pipe carrier from Pick River to come and join us and to, to have that strength to pray for all, for Paksua National Park and for the, to co the workers in Pakasa and uh, the relationship to grow more in, uh, in a good way. It is an ancient ritual that has been passed through generations. This is what we call the little sacred fire. And as I put the branches, the cedar branches all around, that would represent the fire. It's likely that smudging ceremonies have been conducted here at the mouth of the Pick River for thousands of years. Innovative agreements made during the founding of the park are one reason the ritual continues today in its ancient form. During discussions to create Puckasaw National Park in the 1970s, the federal government made commitments to local First Nations that treaty rights for hunting and fishing would continue within the park, as well as trapping, free access, employment, and other benefits. Establishment of the park has also offered another type of protection. Archaeological remains of the original inhabitants of the area 
have been identified and monitored since the park was established. The most significant are stone structures that can be found along the pebble beaches of the Lake Superior shoreline. They're thought to have been built by the ancestors of the Ojibwe people that lived here thousands of years ago. I've been studying with the archaeologists at uh, uh, the Paxa Pits for about 25 years now. And uh, every time I come back, and especially when I get to work uh, with one of these things here, it just puts me in, in total awe to see that these things still exist. You know, we're doing our best to preserve them and all that. The Pakasaw pits are fragile, simply cobblestones piled up to form wall enclosures. We don't really know for sure what they were used for, but a uh, couple, couple of suggestions uh, might be that uh, these, uh, these particular type of uh, features were used for either uh, shelters, which would kind of make sense. The other thing that, uh, that they might be used for vision quests where people would come down and do some ceremonial stuff. Some of the other speculations might be that uh, these were used for, for uh, blinds or for oncoming enemies. Uh, you got to really think about uh, you know, why people would come down, live on these, on these kinds of uh, areas. And uh, you got to really put your imagination to work to try and figure these out. I was born of the year to be on the water. And the establishment of Puckasaw National Park will ensure the continuation of cultural and traditional activities for the First Nation people of the region for generations to come. In turn, First Nation communities have helped shape the vision and direction the park is taking. Perhaps it's one way to explain the many success stories of Puckasaw National Park. Pakasa had my dad come in a couple of years ago and build one of his birch bark canoes. He's a master canoe builder. He went and spent the summer, the better part of the summer, doing that project. And, uh, and then just this past year, Pakasa asked me to write a song to commemorate the canoe. This rugged paradise is more than just an adventurer's dream destination. It's a sanctuary for a storied culture and also a key refuge for threatened species. But most importantly, Puckasaw is emerging as a model for Parks Canada, as more parks like it are created across the country. For the finished life For the finished line. For 125 years, this old lighthouse has stood watch over the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Adélo Perroquet, bon, depuis le début des années 80, la station est abandonnée. Les bâtiments sont très fatigués, etc. C'est un patrimoine, c'est un patrimoine canadien qui 
qui se détériore. Now the lighthouse may be getting a new life as a bed and breakfast for adventurous tourists. But there is concern about how some of the neighbors will feel about the renovations. Puffins have lived on this island long before the lighthouse was here. On est dans un endroit unique et très fragile. This land is highly prized by the civilized and the wild. From the whales that swim the surrounding seaway. Things going on, the young gang. This is amazing, piling in here. To the dandelions growing on barren coastal islands. This plant has the highest level of conservation value of all plant species that occur in the Mingan Archipelago. To the tourists who love this land, the islands of Mingan Archipelago National Park are both alluring and ecologically essential. But with visitorship to the park growing steadily, ecologists must find answers to some tough questions. How can we as humans access this place, visit this place? and still allow this place to fulfill its full ecological potential. Some come, you know, for uh, the animal life, uh, the plants, you know, the rare uh, living things that you find uh, all over the place. Uh, and, and some come for the adventure. Uh, I think it really depends, but certainly the monolites, you know, are probably one of our great star uh, within the park. Mingan Archipelago National Park and Reserve is home to the largest concentration of monoliths in Canada. They have been carved and shaped as the islands of the archipelago themselves have risen out of the Gulf of St. Lawrence through the millennia. The islands are, are limestone rock platforms that have slowly emerged out of the ocean as the isostatic uplift has brought the whole earth crust uh, rebounding up after the glaciers retreated. Uh, this place is a nice place to see actually how the, the islands were formed because the barren lands here are open enough for us to see the old levees, um, the old ancient shorelines of where the, the islands used to, used to meet the sea. <laughs> In the 1970s, when miners began exploring these limestone islands for sources of dolomite, the local population resolved to stop industrial development within the archipelago. And the population say, no, we don't want the island to be distracted. So they kind of say, uh, oh, we fall, you know, the, 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 the local population, they say they want to, to, to protect the islands. So they decided to say it, and the government of Quebec decided to name Mingan Archipelago Arrondissement Naturel. The government of Canada bought the island in 1983. So in 1984, the uh, park reserve was created for the enjoyment of the population, but also for protecting those treasures, almost uh, like geological treasure, sea, uh, sea marine birds, plants, and culture. Mingan Archipelago National Park is located on the north coast of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. It's made up of 20 limestone islands and over a thousand granite islets and reefs. Since the park's establishment, visitorship has risen from a few thousand to over 30,000 visits a year. 
Although the monoliths of the park may be the main draw, the wildlife of the islands also brings hundreds of visitors here. There's a huge amount of cold water upwelling here, and that means these waters are oxygen rich, which makes them very productive. So that's great for birds, great for fish, uh, great for whales, great, great for seals. This place here is booming with life. It's a really a hot spot for productivity in the marine environment. Ecologists are especially attentive to populations of marine birds that dwell within the park. The reserve ranks as one of the most important nesting sites for marine birds in all of Canada. More than 65,000 call the islands of the Mingan Archipelago home. Of all the species of seabirds in the park, these days, Parks Canada ecologists are most attentive to a resident puffin colony. The puffins are thriving in the Mingan Archipelago. But there are plans for construction near the historic nesting grounds of the puffin. Park managers want to refurbish a century-old lighthouse on Ile au Perroquet so that it can be made into a bed and breakfast for visitors. Ecologists want to make sure that when the renovations start, they won't upset the habitat of the puffins on the island. After 25 years of existence, this park is actually going ahead with the renovation of the lighthouse station. So quite clearly, there is a balance that is established between uh, human presence and wildlife in this case. Striking the right balance is the whole idea here. In very simple words, we just want to make sure this Perroquet Islands remains Perroquet Island. The lighthouse station is a beloved piece of architecture in the park, the setting for many stormy legends and a draw for hundreds of visitors. Alors ça a une très grande importance dans le cœur des gens et aussi pour euh, autant pour les gens locaux mais comme pour les gens qui viennent de partout ça quand ils voient cette île là c'est wow il y a un mot wow tu sais, on s'exclame on est ébahi par par rapport à la station pour pouvoir accueillir des gens et qui puissent séjourner et puis avoir le privilège là, de vivre euh, un moment de la vie de gardien de fort isolé sur une île sur un rocher perdu dans Saint Laurent but the original residents of the island were here long before the lighthouse was built. Puffins in French are called macareux, but this island is called Île aux perroquets. That means parrot island. Back when Samuel de Champlain, the founder of Quebec City, sailed into the Gulf of St. Lawrence, he noted down the presence of sea parrots, as he called them. That name stuck. By studying activity of the puffins on the island, Jan Tutte hopes he will be able to advise the restoration of the lighthouse so that it will disturb the puffin colony as little as possible. What we do here for our inventory is refer to a detailed map, essentially a very long mosaic photograph of these cliffs. We spend a given period of time noting every bird movement in and out of the cliff. That allows us not so much to know exactly how many birds there are, but to have a standard reading of the level of use each part of the cliff has. Monitoring the puffin population in Mingga Archipelago National Park is done with the support of Parks Canada ecologists. But in the waters surrounding the islands of the park, another creature of the Gulf of St. Lawrence is on its own. That. Something's happening there. There are hopes to provide protection to the waters surrounding the Mingan Archipelago. Whoa, another fifth guy coming in. Look at this. But until then, 
a small cadre of privately funded researchers are the only ones keeping an eye on the whales of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. This is amazing. Checking us out. Okay, well, we'll keep stick with tic tac toe, see if he gets a little curious or something. This is not just any whale watching tour. I thought he was getting curious because I, I he slowed down to look at what I, what this thing was all of a sudden in the water. Okay, stop. Richard Sears has been okay. studying marine mammals in the Gulf of St. Lawrence for more than 30 years. When they're singles, they're not always as easy to approach as when they're in groups. And you get more for your effort in the groups, usually. Sears heads the Minga Island Cetacean Study. It's a nonprofit research organization that is dedicated to the study of blue, fin, minke, and humpback whales. <laughs> But this operation isn't cheap, and there are limited sources of funding. To help finance much needed equipment, the researchers have taken a novel approach. They allow tourists to tag along and even help out, but for a price. context of our research, we try to avoid whale watching as the way it's done in other places where they go up just for two or three hours and it's kind of a fast food thing. When the people come with us, they have to realize they're coming with a research group and they're going to be out the whole day no matter what. The average trip lasts six to eight hours, but sometimes unexpected visitors can delay the return to shore. That's a big basking shark. Woo! These are the second biggest fish in the ocean. Oh, look at the size of that. Uh, big guy, that's a big shark. We could probably ID it, too. Monitoring whale populations that dwell close to a seaway that is a major Canadian industrial shipping lane means that keeping a special eye on levels of toxins in the water is a top priority for the researchers. Sometimes we re-biopsy some animals for toxic analysis or for other kinds of analysis. We use an arrow that's got a specially designed tip that takes sort of a cross-section of the blubber and skin. And then you can just go pick up the arrow and cut the pieces as you need them and take them back home and take them to the lab. OK, avance. Besides toxins, other threats to whales in the Gulf of St. Lawrence include oil spills and fishing nets. We had one that got caught in some fishing gear a few weeks ago. An animal we know well, it just bolted out of here. We haven't seen it since. It's an animal we usually see quite regularly. But it got scraped up a little. 
If the waters surrounding the islands of the Mingan Archipelago are to be designated as a national marine conservation area, integrating conservation efforts into the commercial enterprises of the region will be the greatest challenge. Si on vient à mettre en sur pied une réserve, euh, un parc marin autour de l'archipel de Mingan, alors l'enjeu va se jouer entre les zones de protection à laquelle on aimerait assurer un suivi et euh, continuer d'acquérir nos connaissances et euh, comment on cohabite aussi avec euh, le volet économique là, euh, au niveau de la pêche. Alors, alors le, le grand enjeu qu'on va avoir à vivre, si jamais on se rend jusqu'à là, c'est euh, euh, concilier les deux activités. But until the park grows to include a marine reserve, Richard Sears and the Minga Island Cetacean Study are on their own. Oh, is this another one coming in? Well, how many humpbacks do we have? One, two, five here, six, seven, eight. It's, it's a nonprofit research group, so we're always sort of looking for funds and, and things of that sort. And that's part of one of the more um, frustrating aspects of this work. This is the really fun aspect of this work, what we're doing on a day like today. The studies of ecologists working in the Mingan archipelago show that the population and diversity of creatures dwelling in the sea and in the air looks promising. But on land, their concern is with the tiniest of species, one that exists in the most fragile of conditions. If this species fizzles out of the Mingan Archipelago National Park Reserve, then it's on its way out of existence forever. <laughs> Qu'est-ce qu'on fait lorsqu'on trouve un nouveau plan? Bien, on va lui donner un nom, un numéro, comme ça. Puis dans les prochaines années, bien, on va être capable de suivre sa vie. Puis à ce moment-là, s'il réussit à fleurir, bien, on va savoir que cette fleur-là a quel âge, parce qu'on a réussi à le suivre depuis le début. The Sparrow's Egg Lady Slipper and the Flat Petaled Yellow Lady Slipper are just two of the 82 cherished, rare or endangered plants growing in Mingan Archipelago National Park. But none is more cherished than the Mingan thistle. Le chardon de Mingan, la façon qu'il fonctionne, va fleurir une seule fois dans sa vie. Ça peut prendre plusieurs années, entre quatre et on a des plants qui ont pris 19 ans au moins à fleurir. Shortly after the Mingan thistle blooms, it dies. Of the 1,500 Mingan thistle plants that are scattered throughout the park, only three bloomed in 2010. Ce qui est important de comprendre, c'est que cette plante-là, c'est seulement les graines. Les graines, c'est leur seul moyen de reproduction. Elle ne se reproduit pas par les racines. Elle n'a pas d'autre façon de se reproduire. C'est pour ça qu'en fait, elle, elle est menacée d'une certaine façon, parce qu'elle n'a pas beaucoup de chances de se reproduire. Puis il y a beaucoup, beaucoup de plantes qui vont mourir avant de réussir à faire des fleurs. Changes in climate are also having an effect on the ability of the thistle to thrive. L'hiver dernier et l'autre hiver d'avant, il y a eu presque pas de neige au niveau du sol, ce qui fait que les plantes ont été exposées au froid sans avoir une protection hivernale. Il y a beaucoup de plantes qui ont été qui sont mortes, surtout les petites plantes. To help ensure its survival, Parks Canada botanists have been helping the Mingan thistle to reproduce. Lorsqu'on a une plante en fleurs, dans les colonies qui sont vraiment trop petites pour survivre à long terme, on va ramasser les graines lorsqu'elles vont être prêtes. Pour le faire, bien, on attend que les fleurs soient toutes brunes, soient desséchées, puis on installe comme un petit, un petit sac en filet par-dessus chacun des groupes de fleurs. Puis là, on attend que les graines mûrissent. 
Lorsque les graines sont prêtes, on les ramasse, on les ponte, puis toutes les graines qui sont bonnes, on va les ressemer dans la colonie. But the Mingan thistle is just one species among hundreds that park botanists must keep tabs on. The Mingan Archipelago National Park Reserve is fairly small uh, in size, but it's very rich in plant species. There are close to 490 vascular plant species, roughly 313, as we know now, bryophytes, which are essentially mosses. And even though it's not a total number, we know that there are at least 190 lichen species. That's a high level of diversity for a, such a small place. In the minds of park botanists, one plant needs the most protection of all. This is among the three places in the world where the Gulf of St. Lawrence dandelion exists. There are only 390 in the park, and that is the largest known population on the planet. Based on international criteria, like from an international perspective of species conservation, this plant is the one that has the highest level of conservation value of all plant species that occur in the Mingan Archipelago. But why put forth such painstaking efforts into saving the existence of a simple dandelion? Science considers everything, every form of life on Earth worth in terms of con conserving biodiversity. And because this species exists and has its genetic individuality, I should say, well, even though it is a dandelion, it is a species worth conserving in, in, in making sure, you know, life keeps on existing in a diverse form. Wow, uh, le fait de retirer une espèce d'un écosystème peut avoir un impact sur l'ensemble de l'écosystème. On ne sait jamais l'importance que peut avoir cette espèce-là. In Mingan Archipelago National Park, management is trying to balance growing visitorship with the need to protect hundreds of fragile species. That means finding ways to help creatures as large as a whale and as tiny as a dandelion. Parks Canada knows it's a problem worth tackling. If we have the intelligence to protect the most grand spaces on our territory for our children, for the generations who will follow us, for those who will... We do a way to emprunt. We are only at least at least. If we had the intelligence to leave the grand spaces protected, pour qu'eux aussi puissent vivre euh, les émotions, euh, les, voir euh, la diversité que, qui, couvre, euh, qui recouvre notre grand pays. Euh, ce serait juste merveilleux.